Many years ago, Yvonne and I wrote a book which sold very well called The Witch's Bible. This book was based on work that I had done in England in the early 1950s when I became an initiated witch. This book caused a furor because it showed an entirely new path of witchcraft. It wasn't Gardnerianism and it wasn't Alexandrianism and it didn't just change the genitalia of the god to those of a goddess. It took a new look at what deity meant. It also included sex magic and a means of mixing the people up in a coven to achieve the results that only sex magic seem able to achieve. We have been continuously amazed that this book has in it a system which hangs together. When we went to India and studied Tantra, which resulted in this book on Tantric Yoga, which is one of the very few books that has ever been written in the West that has been translated into Hindi and is selling well in the Indian market. We were amazed that the system contained in Tantra was also mirrored in the Witch's Bible. The people who put together the system that I was taught in England in the 1940s, late 1940s and early 1950s knew what they were doing. Just yesterday we got a letter from Australia talking about the engraving that we have on the Athame or Athame depending on which cult of words you belong to. That engraving has an inner meaning which this letter explained in great detail. And the letter ended up saying, obviously, when you wrote the Witch's Bible, you didn't know what the meaning was. That is absolutely true. We didn't know what the meaning was, the inner meaning of the signs. Just as we didn't know that the sequence of events for a ritual that was in the Witch's Bible exactly corresponded to the sequence of sexual power raising and altered states of consciousness that is inherent in Tantra. Now I have said there are two things that sex magic and Tantra do. They allow you to raise a great deal of power to send out to do your bidding and they also work at changing your state of consciousness, getting you into an altered state of consciousness. Sex is one of the basic primeval, if you like, urges, drives. The drive for your genes to survive is absolutely basic to your life. Another drive is food, getting food, living. And that living drive is only used so that your genes can survive. In other words, living is important until your genes survive. The Japanese did an experiment on a raft in the Pacific. They marooned a whole bunch of men and women to find out what would happen if a boat sank during the Second World War. What they found was that after a few days of starvation, those people went crazy from a sexual point of view. Every spare moment it seemed, they were doing it. And somehow or other, the statistics showed that the women did it more often than the men, and I don't quite know what that means, but there it is. That's what the Japanese results showed. And often we have seen in other studies that sex is more important than food. But nevertheless, hunger and starvation is another drive. When the natives get restless in Africa and they're being starved, 
guess what? The population goes up. Yes, of course, we have all sorts of infant mortality, but <coughs> the number of births increases exponentially. I happen to believe that psychic phenomena are also part of our inborn drives. These are things that we all have and that we can use to help us survive. That feeling you have of somebody coming up behind you is one which we all have and we can develop. The methodology associated with putting out energy is also something that we all have and we can develop. In the Magical Reality Tape, which is really the tape you should view before this one, we have shown how to feel your energy and how to gauge it with things like a Crookes radiometer and a table tennis ball, and why tuning is important, and the meaning of tables of correspondences. In developing this energy, you can very quickly show that if you have two people of the opposite gender and they do things like cross-gender feel the energy, you will feel the energy much more powerfully than if it's just someone of the same gender. Now, I have to make it clear to all our gay friends that I'm not necessarily talking about genitalia. This doesn't go by genitalia. If you have a gay couple, they can raise the energy among themselves, between themselves, just as well as heterosexual couples can. It's a matter of something in the electrical fields of the person. Dr. Loystone, before his untimely death, did a whole series of experiments on measuring the energy fields of people using large coils placed on the head. And he showed that men and women have different fields. People are now experimenting and showing that men and women use different parts of their brains, and I think the two things are interconnected. I'm sure when they carry on those experiments, as Dr. Stone had, they will find that with gay people, some gays some gays with male genitalia react with a female field and some gays with male, male genitalia react with a male field. I think when we look at their brains we will also see these differences in the brain structure. I think there will be a long argument now going forward into the future about whether these structural differences and the way we use our brains are different because of the way we're born or the way we're trained. Personally, I think it's because of the way we're trained. But it may be that it's a combination of the way we're born and the way we're trained. No matter what, people of opposite sexual orientation have the capability of raising a tremendous amount of power between themselves. When they first do it, it's an exciting new little project and consequently they raise a great deal of energy and they can feel it and they're quite surprised by it. We have a unique ability because we run a school where we have trained thousands upon thousands of people to do various energy experiments. And the first thing that we get them to do is try their energy at different times of the day. And I'm going to get up and draw some little graphs on the board. If we put dawn about here and midnight here, then we find that there is an upsurge of energy like this at dawn, just before you wake up, and that that energy gradually fades away 
during the day with maybe a peak after dinner until we come back down again. And so energy is actually lowest at midnight and highest at about 6 to 7 a.m. This is a very consistent finding. Now you can move that peak by going to bed in the afternoon and then waking up about midnight. If you want to do a ritual, there's one way of peaking the energy at midnight for the ritual. The next thing we asked the people to do was try sexual abstinence. How does sexual abstinence affect your energy levels when you are presented with a member of the opposite sex who is willing to work with you? Well, we find that as the days progress, the energy level goes up until it's a peak at about the third day. This is being celibate for three days. And after three days of celibacy, the energy, if you like, you turn on more quickly after three days. And then gradually then, that fades away until after about 30 days, you're quite low, and in fact, you are about the same as you were after one day. This is the body adjusting to the celibacy. What happens with diet? What happens if you go on an almost starvation diet? Well, the same thing happens. After about three days, your energy levels are high. And by the way, you're not very hungry because at this point, the body starts using its own internal resources and starts consuming its own fat and muscle. So you must exercise if you're going to do this. The need for food as a promoter of energy then fades away just as sex does. So if you're starving, you're very hungry in the first few days as the body adjusts its balances. But after three days, your energy is high and you're ready to go on for a long time. But your energy begins to fall off again. These experiments are the results of something like 5,000 students plotting graphs of how they felt and how much energy they felt and how many books they could penetrate with their energy over these periods. They're not something that you can find in any book except ours, but there they are. This is what actually happens in the real world. How do we put this into a practical system. Well, obviously we're going to start something somewhere and after three days when everything is peaked we're going to do some kind of a ritual. And the question is, how can you get turned on the most? Well, let us say that after three days you're faced with a member of the opposite sex who is willing and able and turns you on. Would that raise your energy? The, obviously the answer is it would. What if this person was lightly draped or just draped a little bit or perhaps even completely sky clad would that turn you on more well that's a decision you have to make in your own mind i think most of the ladies will say that they would like people to be lightly draped so that there's some little mystery still left 
What if you then chanted together? Well, maybe that would turn you on. In the first tape you saw Yvonne chant over a candle. What if you danced together? That for sure would raise the energy between you. So all of these things can be put together into a sequence of events. So you start off by getting together in a container for the energy, which is a circle. You stand with male, female alternating around in the circle. And you start off by maybe singing some light song, perhaps a little bawdy, who knows. Then you dance, taking first this partner, and then taking this partner, and then taking the next partner, going around the circle, everybody dancing, a nice, slow, romantic dance. After the dance, so sing, dance, and then chant. Stand in the circle with your hands not quite touching. When, you st when people stand and clasp hands like this, the energy is crossed at the palms and it doesn't flow around the circle properly. When you stand in a circle, you must have your hands parallel, your fingers parallel to the person next to you. You can do it this way. Or you can do it this way, depending on how you feel, how the person's hand is next to you. Always do it with the right hand down and the left hands up. Because that tends to make the energy travel in a clockwise direction. You can try this. It's very easy. Get some people to stand in a circle and then cross and parallel their fingers and you'll find one way you can feel it and the other you can't. Try it with the right hand down, then try it with the left hand down, and you'll find the energy seems to flow in opposite directions. Okay, sing, dance, chant, and then focus and send. Focus and send. If you're going to do a sorcery procedure with a large number of people, remember to place the goddess image in a circle outside the main protective circle. This is a single protective circle. The people who are in this circle should be sky clad or very likely clad in a natural fiber. Do not use polyesters or any plastic type fibers because they tend to stop the flow of energy. Here we're going to send this energy out directly from the circle. If we're going to call and demand that a god or goddess be present, then we will send that energy at the same time. If we're going to do a sorcery procedure, we're also going to have a cat in this circle. And we may even have a little statuette of a god or goddess that we have put energy into in the preceding weeks that we can dump into the fire, which is normally in the center of the circle. In this way, we maximize the total output of what we are sending out to make something happen. Many people will say, well, this is a lot of work. And yes, that's right, it is a lot of work. The thing is, how important is the aim of the group? Is the aim of the group to change some politician's head? Well, that's pretty easy because politicians aren't all that smart. Um, and they're all that firm necessarily in their convictions. If the aim is the healing of somebody with some disease that they really want and who, and who have asked for healing, so that we're in an ethical set here, it may be more difficult. 
What if one of the group here is a mother who wants to heal her child? Well, that's an important thing to her and the effort is obviously worth it. The other thing we should realize is that people who work in this form of Wicca or witchcraft are not smooth below the waist. And they have found that sex is fun, sex is enjoyable, that sexual attraction like this is great. But notice we haven't talked in here about copulation or anything like that. We're just dancing sky clad. So the next phase of this will be to see if we can alter our state of consciousness, if we can alter our head so that we can receive information. How do we do that? Well, the recent great discovery in endocrinology is that the body produces morphine, natural morphine, when you have a good solid orgasm. It's called endorphine. And that means when you produce endorphine that you are drugging yourself with morphine so that your head can reach into other spaces. Now there are lots of other things that you should know about the meditative part of this procedure which proceeds after this circle. How do you get from dancing nude through sex into a meditative circle? Well, obviously, you get out of this protective circle, you have an orgasm, and you come into your church for the meditation. Your church is made up, as we have shown in other tapes, of three circles, which represents the three layers. The keeping back of the abyss, the earth plane, and the spiritual plane. You enter this circle through the eastern gate. Um, you can be clad or sky clad, it doesn't really matter. You're going to meditate in here, and you're perhaps going to be very, very relaxed. If you've been on a fast here, then it is good, of course, to have bread and wine. Before you start this meditation, that is a promise to the body that, hey, once this meditation is done, we're going to go eat. It takes the edge off the hunger. Bread and wine become a very practical thing to help you with this altered state of consciousness. I wonder how many people realize what the bread and wine does to them. We make it a big mystical thing, oh, it's Mother Nature, we have to bless the bread, we have to make this wine, and we have to bless the wine. All that's very nice, but there's a practical thing behind it. It's not just some mystical thing. We're altering the chemistry and we're altering our head. The other thing we haven't said is, what about the timing of this whole thing? The Earth has certain natural rhythms, which are mainly demonstrated by the Moon. One time, of its cycle, the moon is full, another time the moon is new or is non-existent. And this is when the moon and the sun are either in line or in opposition. And this is when the tides of the ocean are getting towards their highest level. The tides come in twice a day, you get a high tide twice a day, but twice a month, those high tides reach up into what the mariners call the spring tides. That doesn't have to do with spring of the year. It has to do with the tide is being higher. And at that time, the energies in our 
property a hire. People on the Outer Banks of North Carolina say that people die as the spring tide goes out, and people are born as the spring tide comes in. And it is in fact true that more babies are born at the full and the new of the moon than any other time of the month. And of course, more murders occur in summertime at the full of the moon than any other time, and people tend to go a little crazy. They uh, grow the hair on the front palms of their hands and they go out and howl. So, it's important that we work in our circle to get the highest energy levels somewhere in this period, which again is three days after full or new moon to the height of the spring tide. I think that is all fairly clear. In Getting this energy between the male and the female, or the people of opposite gender feeling, to the highest, I have to ask the ladies, quite honestly, which, does, which gets you most excited? Dear old Joe, who you live with all the time, and you know every mood, and you've been through a bunch of negative and positive experiences with him, is he going to get you excited, or is that nice-looking guy with the tight buns and the long, gentle fingers, who you know is a poet, is he going to get you more excited? Which one of the coven members is going to turn you on the most? Obviously, there's a lot of possibility of sexual um, dictatorship in a coven. The way to avoid that is to let the ladies get together before the coven meeting and select their own party, own partners. Of course, some of the men are going to be continually disappointed. However, make a roster after the first couple of turns so everybody gets a turn with everybody. If you don't do that, then some of the people are not going to get turned on. And you can't say you're going to do something and then not do it. You can't tell everybody, well, you're going to mix it up and then not do it in this phase of the operation, in the orgasm phase. If you're going to always have people go with their own partners, that's perfectly all right. There's nothing at all wrong with it. Provided they've had their sexual fast, they will probably do all right. They will do a little bit better, in fact, some will do a lot better, if they get a little strange stuff. But make sure that you don't put the young girl with the old fart and things like that. Don't put people together who obviously are incompatible. And of course, be continuously careful about condoms and the various problems associated with modern sexually transmitted diseases. It's no good coming into a circle like this and just worrying all the time about whether you're going to catch something. You may look good, but am I going to catch something from it? And that is why many covens now have what they call a condom compact. I think Morning Glory Zell, um, together with Otto Zell, who is now being called Oberon, um, started the idea of having a condom compact. So that everybody in the circle would use condoms, and any time they had sex with outsiders, they would all guarantee that they would use condoms. The thing in the old days in Europe was that one of the promises you made once you joined a circle was that you would never have sex with anybody outside the circle. The feeling was that if you had perhaps six different partners to choose from, then you were getting enough. Nowadays that's probably not true. I think that's all I really have to say, but if you 
have a circle of this type, be careful, have a roster, make sure that nobody is dictating who sleeps with who. Oh, one other thing. One of the things the ladies report is that many are disappointed because on the first experience they find nothing works. Yes, they know how tab A fits in slot B and all that, but the little subtle signals that pass between two sexual partners are not yet in place. So in the Witch's Bible, we recommended that the various possible combinations of couples live together for like a week as man and wife so that they would, in fact, learn the sexual signals of one another and there wouldn't be any surprises in this phase of the circle. How does all this relate to Tantra? Well, the Tantrists put their whole life into this type of sexual operation. Their whole life is built around both raising energy and altering their states of consciousness. And the biggest emphasis is placed on the thousand petal lotus and getting through the thousand petal lotus into an altered state of consciousness. Their cycle is very simple to understand. If this is full moon, it is three days offset from full moon. It is amazing how often three days come into the literature. People are supposed to be not to be buried for three days. The spirit doesn't necessarily leave the body completely for three days after death, etc., etc. I'm going to start here at new moon. At new moon, they have a big feast. So here we have a feast. Lots of food. Lots and lots of food. And at that feast, they marry for a month a new partner. So they select and marry a new partner. And they live with that partner for three days, but no sex. Just before this point on the cycle, they couple, but they do not have an orgasm. And it's called Maithuna. The man lies on his back and the woman mounts him and they stay coupled like that for 32 minutes without having an orgasm. These women learnt many years ago that vaginal contractions were good for them. Nowadays um, it's become the fashion to talk about Kegel contractions. These are the contractions that a woman should do every day with her vagina so that all of the muscles down there don't atrophy. If she does these contractions every day, then she's not going to need one of those awful diapers that we keep seeing advertised on TV when she gets older because all of those sphincter muscles will be good and strong. Anyway, here the lady does her best to get the guy really close to orgasm. And he does his best without moving, just by tensing and releasing, to get her close. Then they come in and they have their big circle, their power raising circle. Now this power raising circle is associated with the lower chakras. This is associated with the genitalia. 
And so they wear odd clothes and they tend to whip one another and do all sorts of things which we probably don't want to do. But they go a little bit crazy, run around in circles and chant and do things, all to raise power. But the last thing they do, after doing this for 32 minutes, is to stand in a circle and chant to the goddess of the lower chakra to grant their wishes. This is their big power raising. Now as the month progresses, every couple of days they're going to move up the chakras. You all know which chakras are which, I'm sure. But they're going to move up through the chakras. And so in this time period, they're thinking about the lower chakras, the pelvic chakras, and things like that. And they're clearing out of their consciousness everything that is associated with those lower chakras. One of the things we did for Tantra was disentangle the gods and the goddesses. And so as you come up this side of the cycle, you're working with goddesses. As you come down over here, you're working with gods. And in the top one here, you're working with the duality of Shakta Shiva. So we're coming up here and we're in the lower chakras, we're in the belly, so we're eating good here. And gradually as we come up, we eat less. And finally up in the higher chakras here, we are going to go and become total vegetarians. Then we're going to start, at this point, into starvation. And as we come up here, we're going to increase our sexual activity. So that down here, where one orgasm a day is acceptable, up here two orgasms a day are, are required. Are required. If you have more, that's fine. But two are required. Then the great day of changing our consciousness is right here, three days, you'll notice, after full moon. And this is where they raise Kundalini. In this day, starting at dawn, the whole day is divided into 32-minute intervals. And this first interval is for sex. That is followed by bathe. It's followed by food, very light food, usually grapes and cheese. And that is followed then by meditation. So here you have the four cycles. Then you change partners and you do the whole thing again. And then you change partners and you do the whole thing again. And what you're doing again after five or six cycles of this is you're moving up through the chakras. This this first one will be down in the lower chakras. The second one will be further up. I can't tell you how far up because it depends on the group. Some of the groups will move very quickly from the lower up into the throat and into the head and out through the brow. But some groups go through each chakra in turn for these cycles. Now, when you get to the upper chakras, you should be able to break free. 
you are so drugged, you've got so much morphine in your body that you naturally break completely out. If it doesn't happen for somebody, then they keep on going. And sometimes there will be a requirement in here for like eight orgasms in 16 hours from everybody involved because the whole group is working to get everybody out. If you read Tantra books where young nymphs or prostitutes or something like that are used, that's just plain not the point. The whole idea here is that everybody, the trained priestess as well as the men, all get their state of consciousness changed. One of the things the real tantrist will tell you is you can't stop there. And that is true because if you totally then cut off sex at this point, you would think by the way after that many orgasms you'd be turned off. But you will find that if you cut it off you will go through the worst drug withdrawal symptoms you've ever come across. So you have to carry on having two orgasms a day, coming down in here to one, and coming down here now, you're coming down the God side. And this is sadness, is the prevailing emotion as you come down. Here where you had all this excitement building up, towards the Kundalini, this way you're leaving it behind. You know it's there, you know that you'll be able to reach it next month, but the real feeling is sadness that you're having to come back into the world. And that's what the gods depict. You come down from the dancing god Shiva into the more serious realms of the gods. And gradually as you come down, you start out here being a vegetarian, you maybe add some fish, add some white meat, and then you come to the big feast, which signals the new moon and the beginning of the cycle all over again with a new and different partner. As I say, they dedicate their lives to this. You can, in a good coven, if that coven is all living in the same house, try this cycle. You can also try speeding it up. But notice, we have within our circle, which happens just in one short period, we have the elements of this. And I would very much um, encourage you to experiment with your circles, to try placing the feast in a different place, try doing the feast at new moon and try doing something approaching the Kundalini instead of just a single circle and a single orgasm at, at or close to full moon. The Tantras have been doing it for thousands of years and don't forget that Tantra was suppressed in India at exactly the same time that witchcraft was suppressed in Europe. The two religions are very close to one another. I don't think I have much else to say. Sex magic works. It's one of the primal drives in our bodies that we are harnessing to make another primal thing happen. In the early primitive days we had these capabilities. We had telepathy. We had the ability to affect other things. And we're using our gene survival and our hunger to reawaken these energies. Of course, you will hear criticism that you can't use sex like this. You can't use sex as a means to an end. I would say that millions of women all over the world, and men too, use sex as a means to an end. Get me that new washing machine, then I can be with you more often. It is a means to an end. Here we're doing it for ends which the whole group want to get to. If we don't do it just for power raising, we also do it to alter our state of consciousness and investigate that inner space which is so neglected in our culture.
Now let me take a few moments of your time to introduce the School of Wicca, which is an arm of the church. The first thing you get when you join the school is a whole series of lectures. Some are in the large format, and some are in the small, convenient booklet format. These cover every possible topic you can imagine. The basic witchcraft course in 12 lectures gives you a thorough grounding in the craft of the wise. To help you along the way, we also have audio tapes that you can listen in your, to in your car and videotapes to show you demonstrations of how to make things work, how to make your tools, how to do real magic. The school runs a library service which allows you to borrow books for a small fee because many of these books are Everything comes to you in plain envelopes. Nothing tells anyone that you are studying witchcraft. You are assured of our personal attention. Here Yvonne is carrying folders from the file cabinets and beginning to work on the answers. This is just about half of one day's file folders. Everything has a student number, and only in encryption files in the computer are the student name and number put together. Here Yvonne is carrying another set of student mail, and you can see in these packed file cabinets, all of the student folders, thousands upon thousands of them. There are, I think, 18 four-drawer file cabinets, and all of them are stuffed with folders. And we take the files out and store them of those students who have gone before. Here is just a small stack of follow-up mailing to people we haven't heard from, people we want to hear from. Here are some of the books we have written in conjunction with the work with the students in the school. We set the new neophytes all sorts of tasks. I'm sorry you can't read the titles on some of these books, but as soon as you join the school you will get a book list. Here is a book written by a student called The Asia School. These are not just two people with a typewriter. This is a large organization that tests and researches information continually to help the course get better. All of these give you proven techniques. This is a large listing of past students. This is just a listing for, would you believe, one year's worth. In addition, Every two months you will get a copy of the church newsletter where people advertise and you will lead, read the latest thoughts. At least twice a year we meet in a large circle like this one which was for the blessing of a baby. And this gives you the knowledge that you're part of a group, a group of friends who will support and help you.